I know that both of you who were here last week, so I, I don't think that anyone needs Mike to read the introduction again. No, probably not. <laughs> but, all right, let's see. So, uh, so this was actually... So I'll, I'll start out by, by saying that the, the first couple of slides are review slides, but the, the, the one thing that I, I will say about every IBL workshop that I, I've attended and every, every little thing that they, they ever do they always start every session by reminding everyone about what IBL is and making sure that, oh, I should have, this is a slide I really want to, making sure that everyone is reminded about the four pillars because that is what will frame everything that the presentations today are in this workshop are about. And so, uh, I, I I realized this also from going to all the IBL workshops that I've attended that I I will say that it's a, a, a little bit harder with a, a virtual workshop, but one of the things that they do is have a a like a piece of paper, like a what what do you call them those. Uh, those boards, paper boards, you know, I'm talking on the easels. What are those called? Pre uh, presentation boards, something like that. They usually have those things around the room and then they have something called the instructor moves and they ask people to write down things that they noticed the workshop facilitators or instructors doing through every class or workshop session that they would want to maybe do in their own classes. And so I, I, I've started doing that with my students, but in the sense that I ask them to think about all of the different techniques that I use in class to, to convey the material to them and then think about how they can replicate some of those techniques when trying to study at, at home. So if I'm showing a short video, well, maybe can you go find a video that could help you learn the material? Or if I say, well, try this problem and take a few minutes to think about it, could you try a problem in the book and then think about it before just emailing me right away and saying, I don't give, uh, you know, I don't get it and I'm giving up right away. Or if I'm, I'm having them do group work and I say, well, explain this concept to somebody in a way they haven't heard it before, then maybe they could find a friend or a classmate to do the, that same sort of thing outside of class. And so I've realized that, that if I, I tell the students, here's what I'm doing and why, or these are the things I've done as an instructor to help you learn the material in class, that are things uh, that you can do outside of class yourself to help you learn the material better than, than I realize that that helps with the, the student buy-in piece that is part of you know, today's workshop. And so I tell the students exactly why I'm doing things and I'm just up front with them. I showed you a video today where we did these in-class quizzes oh, well, you like that Kahoot? Here's a link to go and do the Kahoot again at home at, at a self-paced uh, 
uh, you know, at a self-paced sort of speed that whatever speed you want to do it at. So if you don't remember the pillars, then it, it really like throws you off sometimes. So I, I do like that aspect of every IBL workshop that I'm at is that they always, always, always remind you of the pillars. And so I have them here for you, but uh, let's see. So that was the first thing. Okay. So the, the first topic then about how you would, would really adapt the IBL techniques to an online environment is just uh, first off framing in terms of the growth mindset and productive failure. So I'd say that I don't necessarily want to focus on only the technology or only on the tools that can be used in online classes, but on the aspects of IBL that can be used in online classes. So uh, growth mindset is, I'd say, something that is, uh, of course, uh, very uh, in, important and that has gotten a lot of attention lately. But be explicit about the value of productive failure Use article, blog post, videos, and short discussions to spread that message of productive failure and growth mindset throughout the semester. And then considering the idea that you might not need to have students turn in every assignment in order to, to um, know that they've been doing the work and that they've been making mistakes and that they've been trying to grapple with the material and learn it. And then one thing that I particularly like that I've started this semester is weekly self-assessments. So I'll, he's going to, you know what, I'll just show you the questions now, but uh, the, these are are things that I, I last semester, I'll tell you that in my online classes, I was doing online discussion boards and it, it was the first time I required them, but it was one of these things where it was the first semester where I knew I wasn't going to see the students at all in a, a lecture or, or, and it wasn't a class that was uh, originally designed to be fully online and so I I tried the discussion questions and then I found out that students like I did have the discussion forum set up so that that students would have to reply to another student before they could see other students responses but then I I found out that students were typing in one letter like A or B and then hitting submit so that it would open up the discussion forum. And then they, not only would the, were they actually, would they like go back and edit their post to hide it? They weren't even doing that. They would just reply to that one letter with the plagiarized post from somebody else. And so I had two students last semester that I had to give a complete failure of the course to. And so <clears throat> I, I, I really thought, it, it's not even that I, I am disappointed in the, those students who cheated, it, because I am, but it's that that is like, that's a mistake that, there wasn't any way they could come back from it and correct. So I, I wanted to like think about what I could do differently because I want them, like if I'm saying like 
well, it's okay to make mistakes and so on and so forth. But then I set it up in such a way that they could make a mistake like that and automatically fail the class. Then I, I realized that's I, I really am sending the wrong message because there are certain mistakes that, that you cannot come back from, like absolutely like cheating on the on the assignments or plagiarizing. And so I, I thought, well, I'm going to do something that I I'm <clears throat> You know, I, I'm pretty sure that that they can't plagiarize because th these are all questions that they have to think about. And and I'll tell you that on the first weekly self-assessment, I had a student put a letter H for the first question and hit submit to, to, in, because she didn't read that it was a, a self-assessment and not a discussion forum. And so... And so then I emailed the student and I, I said to her, you know, like, I know why you, you, you know, why, why you were putting that H in there, but I, I need you to understand that there's nothing like to cheat on in this class. And there's no reason for you to cheat in this class. You just have to answer the questions every week. And so and then she, and I, I did warn her, I said, you know, like, if you were to do that in any other class, you probably would have gotten a failing grade for the class automatically. And so she uh, misread that email and thought that I was going to fail her. And I said, no, you, you that, that's not what I said at all. I said, this, I'm trying to, to help you see that it was a mistake to try to cheat the system like that, and that you, I'm giving you a chance to learn from your mistake and trying to alert you to it so that you don't, you know, that, that doesn't happen to you in a future class. And so I, I, I've also learned through all of this, if, if you're open and honest with the students about that mistakes are okay, that, that things happen, that it, it, it really does help and they, they usually understand and learn something from it. So these seven self-assessment questions, I'll, I'll tell you that I, I, I looked at at least like 20 or 30 different weekly self-assessments that different math teachers are, are using that I, I found online and in, in books and papers and things like that. And I, I sort of like, this is a synthesis of all of those other self-assessments that I found. And these are, are the questions that I, I came up with that were either like in common between the self-assessments or ones where it said this is a, a question that there's some research behind it that you should ask or, or just a, a question that I personally felt like it was important for me to, to get out of the students every week. And so... I, I don't always get quality answers, but I, I will say that I generally, like unless a student, even though it says explain or something like that, in, unless the student leaves a question completely blank, then they, they get a credit for that question because these are in my opinion, supposed to be low stakes. And if they don't explain something fully, then, then this is still in the back of my head that uh, you, you're only hurting yourself idea, you know? And so like, I, I, I know, and I also have come to the realization that some students like that, that, and I'll talk about this in more detail later, but that reading and writing and reflection are some of the hardest things for students to do. 
and for anyone to do, and especially in a public forum, like a, a school or a class session or something like that. And so the students might not be open to explaining as much to you in week one or two or three, but week four or five, six, like I have students who are only playing one or two words writing paragraphs now because they're like, well, I like that one thing he said in class. I'm going to write about it. And so, so, I mean, I, I, I'm telling you that this is sort of the, uh, uh, been like the one thing I really, really liked the semester that I hadn't tried before. So now, I was going to then have the the two of you like take a minute or so to think about this idea of growth mindset and productive failure and maybe the weekly self assessments and then and then after that maybe add one thing to the the list here or of how to promote growth mindset and productive failure that you've done or or maybe a question that you want to ask or maybe something that you would add to the self-assessment, anything like that. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and then I'll have you share. I'll mute myself to make as quiet as possible. All right, so um, do either of you want to share first? Uh, I would like to comment about something that you said earlier that you put a discussion where the students can <clears throat> only see others after they submitted theirs. But what, you, what happened in your class happened in mine as well. Students just type probably a dot or something so that they can open and see everything else. So what I did with my class was whenever I saw that, the students will get zero for the task. Whatever that the task that we have there, the students will receive zero. There is no question asked. But if they submit something and it was incorrect, they can see what others have and then they can submit the new things that they said that this is the correction of the previous one. So, and I told them they can submit as many as they like, but they have to submit something first. So I was pretty, <clears throat> pretty harsh in that sense. And I think the students learn from that. And if the students didn't correct their mistakes, then they are just going to get nothing as well. Because the point here comes from you are looking at others and then learn from your mistake and correct your mistakes. So that's what I was hoping. And if the students didn't even look at the, the other polls and didn't correct theirs, then they got nothing, they got zero. So I don't know whether it's a good thing or not, but it's but kind it's... of making them really try hard to make a correction in everything they did. So I, I, I think that that's exactly the the I, idea and the, because like students I, I, like a, it's not you are you I, are breaking not, up. Jeff. Oh I am? Oh no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, here Mike, why don't you share then? So one of the things I usually like to do for the growth mindset is with um, providing students opportunities to extend what they've learned in the class or through homework or through 
with quizzes or exams. So what I usually do is try to give them a little bit more challenging problems on quizzes or exams that are not straightforward from the class or from the textbook or from their homework, but it takes them just one or two steps further in their thinking process. And I, I don't make it high points or, or high stakes. It's just, I want them to be able to think, how can they extend their knowledge to something new? And at first they might, they, they, they struggle with it. And I, I, I let them know that this is, this is okay. This is the point where you're, you're actually taking the steps of actually learning from your mistakes. So that's what I've been doing in the past. Um, um, in terms of online courses, I've tried this with discussion boards, but it just, it hasn't turned out very well this year. I've did, just did, had trouble. Sorry, had, sorry to interrupt. Did your students participate in that? In the online discussion boards? Yeah. Not, only about half the course is actually participating in the online discussions. I'm not requiring it in the course mm -hmm. or making it points, but it started off about two thirds of the course is participating in online discussion, helping each other out. And then it just, it fizzles out. So about halfway through the semester, about half, and then keeps getting worse as the semester goes on. That's what happened when we do not like give them points for doing something, then they just decide not to participate in that. So I, I think that that uh, you, you're saying all of the things that that I'm going to talk about today because I, I I'll tell you that that's exactly why I I I kind of did not like the discussion forums also because some students waited until the last day or did it late and then the students who wanted to do it on time or early couldn't because they had no one to interact with and so uh, the, that's another reason why the weekly self-assessments uh, have helped but I'll, I'll tell you that it, <clears throat> everything that, that both of you have said about giving the students unlimited attempts to get right and learning from their mistakes, not making it high stakes, but getting them to extend their, their learning. So th that's all the mastery grading, uh, base grading idea. And that's interconnected to IBL because of how IBL is framed. And so uh, students do need to learn the material for themselves and for future courses, but that needs to be internal and intrinsic and they have to have to either want it or not. And so uh, students, of course, especially online can look up the answers, but are encouraged to try it until they understand. And that's why having extensions of I ideas is helpful because then it's not something they might be able to look up as, as easily. And then uh, of course, uh, even if there are points assigned to something, then if students can redo it an unlimited number of times, then th their stakes are not as high. So now this is where I, I think another key is, is that the incentives are not point based, but they're they're like, if you do something extra, if you are showing that you really want to learn the material or go deeper into the material, then for an A in the class, you can do an optional final project. But the final is not mandatory, but it is if you want an A. You know, so you have to want to do that little extra to want to learn more if you want the A. <clears throat> so, and that sort of, I, I think the same thing that I think I'll, any instructor tries to do through the idea of extra credit a lot of times is, well, you know, these extra credit problems are the problems that are a little deeper and they're the problems that you, the, the students who have an innate desire to learn usually end up doing. And 
if you just say that, you know what, there's not extra credit, but if you want an A, you have to do it, then it's a, it, it frames it differently. It's because I think if people hear extra credit, they're, they're, they're trained to think it's a little bit more difficult or trained to think it's a little bit harder. And so I've sort of uh, don't really need extra credit anymore because of this mastery based grading. So here's what I do. <clears throat> or actually, here's what I've been doing since the, the pandemic began, at least, <laughs> because I there was no way that I was going to figure out how to use a, a proctorial or a lockdown browser or like a, whatever it is, whatever techniques or Zoom testing or, or anything like that. <clears throat> and I even I had a, a, a short conversation with my, my associate Dean last week about this because he asked me, like he flat out asked me, what are you doing about testing? Because like, I, I think that I honestly, I didn't ask him for sure, but I have a feeling that the, uh, the, there's been a really high number of students who have complained to him from other classes about privacy issues of having their cameras on during testing or having to scan their IDs or, or whatever it is, or having to have the audio on. And so I... I I'd, I'd say that I I know he hasn't had any complaints about the testing from my class because I haven't had any. <laughs> so I mean, that's I I I'm giving them the weekly self assessment and I've stopped using a point system even because I I want it, students to realize well uh, be able to convert this to the grading scale more easily. So when they get up to a 94% or 92%, 95%, whatever an A is for, for your class, and they would know what their grade is. And so the, the online homework assignments, students can do them with unlimited attempts until they reach 100%. But if they want to ask me a question about it or dispute like uh, the system didn't accept my answer, I make them submit their written work before I, I will take a look at it. And so nine times out of 10, the student usually doesn't get back to me. And so I, I know I, I hate to think that I, you know, I caught that scammer, but those I caught the scammers who weren't really trying to learn the material. And so I, I know it's not much of a safeguard, but at the same time, you know what? Like it's online, there's not much I can do except give them the opportunity to learn and then they have to accept that. And then I give the students a choice of attendance and participation in the synchronous sessions and and then weekly participation in homework assignments. And so usually what I'll do is at the end of every class, they'll get, I'll give them one problem to do for homework that they'll upload their written work for. And I'll just look at that one problem per week and, or two, one or two problems per week instead of giving a test. And so it's not as much grading at once. I I use the speed grader and it, it's very, <clears throat> it's been very simple after I've, I've mastered that myself, but then the students can still resubmit it until they reach a hundred percent. So I, I put in the comments like, Hey, like, uh, you know, like you missed a, a negative sign here, or, or there was a couple of times already this semester where I just flat out put in the comments, your submission was completely unacceptable. I want you to uh, like, uh, like 
rewrite it and type it out and and explain every step clearly, define the variables, and then I'll give you the 100%. So I, I have no issues with just flat out telling the student that your work was completely un, unacceptable. You're getting a zero, but I'm willing to let you redo it. it because I, I it's not about the fact that, I, like if, if I gave the student partial credit, or only took off 1.2 points, they don't ever, learn that 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 their work wasn't up to certain quality that is is a quality that they might need to to have for a future class also you know so like i also give the students an option for the comprehensive final exam or project especially for students who i have some students who at the beginning of the semester were claiming things like, like, oh, I'm having internet issues. Uh, can I just watch the recording later and get the attendance credit? No, because at the end of the semester, if you don't like your grade, you can take the optional final exam or project to increase your grade. But otherwise, I expect you to be there to participate in the class. But I'm not going to penalize you if you have have internet or connectivity issues or something come up that you can't make it to class, but I'm gonna give you that out to still get that part of the grade by, by using that optional final or project at the end of the semester to, to still get that 100%. You just have to show me that you were in the material. So that, that's why, like, because I've had so many students this semester in the last semester like uh, I even have some that are working during class time because they picked up a second job or something or they, their boss needed them to work extra and they can't make it to class. Well, guess what? You're going to watch the videos and do the handouts on your own and then you can take the optional final at the end. You can still get 100% in the class, but you're going to get it a different way. So I, I don't, I, as, as long as, as at the end, I know that they've mastered it, then I, I don't care. And I, I think that that's what's gotten me about the final exams all along is that I don't think that they really show if a student mastered the material or not. I know if they mastered it because I know their day-to-day -day work. So I, like, I, I can't tell from just a multiple choice final or just a one day thing or like if a student has math anxiety or or whatever the, whether that one test showed if they mastered it so this is what I've been doing so uh so Enda and and Mike uh uh what are, are your thoughts on on this or like what do you do in your class to any additional things to maybe to encourage your students to reach that a uh, full level of mastery. So with homework, I, I follow the exact same thing as, well, not exactly the same thing as you do, but I do have mastery learning on all the homework um, for my classes for the, using the online homework system. Um, and I encourage them and remind them weekly that it's, it is, it's based on mastery learning and that you can easily earn 100% on the homework which of course will directly impact your success on quizzes and exams in the class. I've also used projects in the class to take away from having high stakes tests count for most of the course grade. So the students have to check in with me on with their project uh, occasionally during the semester just to, for progress reports. That seems to be going pretty well. Uh, my students, I don't know. Well, the homework, they are all given because uh, it's the requirement from, from the department, right? I cannot choose whether I want to give them or not. So because that's like a package that I have to do. So I give them homework through the online system. But I have tests 
and the tests are also from the online system so if they want to cheat they can cheat but in addition to that i have the weekly tasks that they have to do and usually that was the one that they have to show their work they have to write their answers so it's not just giving me the final answer that they can cheat from somebody else but they have to show how they get that and if they make a mistake i'm just telling them that okay your number three is incorrect and they have to find a way to correct those and if they are not doing it, then they're just losing points. And most of the students, well, all students doing that task because I don't know, probably they think it's easier because they can see and correct their mistakes. But there are students that do not even do any of the homework. And I don't know the reason for that. I remind them every week and still some of them just getting all that zeros because they never open it. And I check one time with my students, I, <clears throat> in Canvas, I wrote in the, the beginning of the week module, I always have a title say, read this, and then I give all the instruction and everything. And then I wrote, if you read this, email me so that I can give you extra points for reading this. Nobody emailed me that. So I know that now they are not even pay attention to what in Canvas, what I wrote there. So I don't know how to force them. Some of the students are really good in coming to class, discuss in the class, because in the class we always discuss things, but they are not good in keeping up with whatever online that are posted in online. So I don't know how to, force them to do that so i i, I think into what, what what you said leads right into the next topic uh because where is it I, I don't i don't know why this is doing this to me because i don't like i oh i know what it is i have to okay so it's all about the community building and solidarity so that this is one of the things that i found really helps get the the students organized in terms of like staying on top of their their work so uh, be intentional in creating space for personal interaction virtual formats so I always do ask the, the students the first few minutes of class to uh, check in and see how they're doing and that's while I'm taking the attendance because I usually uh, let them in from a weight room and check the attendance off in Canvas as I, I go. That makes it easier for me. And, and then be explicit with the students about why the community building and being there for each other is, is important and remind them throughout the semester in multiple ways and just be authentic and show that you care, which I, I think that this is the hardest thing sometimes because we think that we, we're showing that we're, we care, but I think if we remind the students that the, like we're there for them, like your, your, your classmates are there for you, like your group members are there for you, like throughout the semester, then they feel that a little bit more. And so that uh, regular and consistent communication does set the, the tone. But then I, I do remind them in breakout sessions during the classes to like check in on each other and, and everything like that after you finish um, the, the problems that, that I, I give you. And then I, I do try to, to check in with the groups every so often but i'll say that some some people will say that that you should you should mix up the breakout uh, breakout rooms every class i i decided this semester not to and that's because i assigned every group to a google jam board before the beginning of the semester and i and I actually, I'll show that their 
jam boards right now so that because if you haven't actually seen it like in like use then it, it might <clears throat> it might seem a little bit odd what i'm talking about but you can see that i like math 14 15 of my college algebra class and i i I gave each group a, a Google Jamboard before the semester started. And by pre-assigning the groups, I didn't have to recreate these Jamboard links every, uh, every class. So then that, the students already knew in advance for the semester, like, all right, and everyone knows before every class, have your group's Jamboard open because when it's time to go to breakout rooms, you can't be looking for the link because what I do is I'll, I'll show you here, like on the first day to build that community and get them to talk to each other. I made each group, <clears throat> excuse me, um, each group had to come up with a, a name and a mascot. And so then I'll tell you though, what I do during class though, is I will put the the problems on the on the whiteboards that on the Google Jam boards that I want them to work on during class. And so if they don't have it actually, uh, if they don't have it open, then they're wasting the five minutes of their breakout group time finding the link. So they always have it open before class. And what I found by keeping the groups uh, the same is that some of them have been meeting outside of class and doing their homework on these on these jam boards also. And so for some of these groups, I, I know that they have a lot more pages than others because they've been doing their homework together and I can see it. But I, I will tell you that you can see like the, I, I put a, you know, they, they've done a variety of different things throughout the the semester and and then oh and i i put that on there like if i think their solution is really good i'll put like a trophy or a, a little icon on it to to uh, you know um just symbolize that or like in a day when i i know one group is really struggling and i'm spending more time with one group than the other i'll i'll have all like eight breakout room boards open on my screen so I can see what they're all doing. And then if I see a group is done, I'll just put an all done sticker so that they know they can leave for the day. You know, because I sometimes do the breakout rooms at the end so that if there's a group that I need to spend more time with, I can. So I don't want to spend my time going back and forth between rooms or making the, the students wait in a group if, if I already can see that they've they're done. And so that really has helped me like manage the groups and get them to talk to each other. And then they're there reminding each other because I, I was in one of their breakout rooms the other day. And, and one of them said, do you want like, do you want to work on the homework after class and this and that? And so I, or, and then they said, Ooh, this person missing today. Like, I hope he, he submitted his assignment. <laughs> so, I mean, they're, they're, like keeping each other more accountable, I think, because they're uh, in the same groups every class. And so I, I know that there's pros and cons to keeping them in the same groups, but I, I, I really think that's been helpful. Oh, I'll tell you this much. On the very first day when, of course, you get some students who don't want to talk and if they happen to all be in the same group, then what I, I did is on the first day, they, uh, when I came to, to their uh, group to show what their name and mascot was, I, I went to a random name generator and that's the name that came up with. And I went to a random mascot generator and that's the mascot it came up with. And that's what they're stuck with for the semester. So now, like, it, like I, I call them Judy Santos, a, a crazy Viking all semester. And then they, and then they finally came up with a mascot. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't think that's a Judy or a crazy Viking. But I, I, I'd say that, you know, like uh, they, 
uh, what was the other group? Oh, this group didn't have anyone uh, come up with the name either. So they they end up being called Ginger Arnold. So that was the name of the random name generator and their mask has a fabulous hippopotamus. So, you know, like I, I'd say that, well, after that, when they, they realize like, you know what, like, like I, it, it, it's something that I, I would say is, is uh, when they realized I was actually serious about them, them talking in groups after that incident, they, when they don't want to want to be called Judy Santos anymore, they start actually doing the, their, their work in the small groups now. So, um, so then I, I do want to say that, that these are, are some of the things that I've, I've done this semester also to sort of build the, a little bit of community. So my differential equations class, I, instead of, of we have a section on modeling linear differential equations. And I, I decided I'm not going to just lecture on, on modeling this time. I'm going to have them like, teach about linear differential equations and then have them pick a problem and, and then explain it to the class. Well, I'll tell you that I didn't put a limit on what, what the uh, problem they did, but you can see that students still picked a variety of problems from the book to do. Like they didn't st stick to just one problem or, and some people did do, the same problem but I, that's okay because when like a, for the people who I know a few students did problem one but when they were presenting they I, I saw the chat messages to each other after they were like great job like you like uh, like you showed a different way to explain it than I did or you know, they were encouraging each other and giving them uh, each other like great feedback about each other's presentations and so I'll tell you that one of them that I, which one did that guy do? Because one of them was so good that if I, if I don't, if I don't show it, I, I would feel really, really bad that I didn't actually at least mention that, that this uh, one student actually uh, did something that I, I would I would never have expected like some students, of course, like just didn't even make a PowerPoint and they just um, put their like written work on the, the screen when they were sharing and talked their way through it. But I did make it clear to them that they needed to explain, like start from a differential equation, explain the the variables, the setup, why it was important to them, that type of thing. And I, I'll tell you, like the, the results were absolutely fantastic. It helped them. It actually did help them get, get to know each other and it helped them build that, that sort of community. And it helped them with <clears throat> realizing like we're not all in the in a silo by ourselves and it also it like if, if somebody made a mistake they no one really no one said anything somebody was stuttering the whole time and I actually at first I wasn't sure if it was a internet connection issue or stuttering and then I I realized he's he has to be stuttering and so it it was just uh it it was an interesting experience that i'd say helped bring the students together and so this guy and i'm, I'm showing this because and they all know that 
their presentations are on the internet anyway. So I don't feel bad about recording this part because they all got 100% on them. Or if they didn't, the only reason why a student wouldn't have gotten 100% is if there, there was some sort of error or in their, their presentation or it, it wasn't fully explained either in the writing or in the live presentation. And then I, I told those students to like uh, what additional explanation I wanted from them and told them type up this ad additional explanation and then I'll give you the 100%. So this still wasn't a uh, like all or nothing or, or anything like that. It was, you can still get that 100%. You just have to clean up your presentation because I want them to know that written communication skills are just as important as the verbal presentation skills of conveying your concepts during class. But this guy, I'm telling you, th this was such a basic, like, like um, basic, like standard problem in a book. And he, he went and he actually simulated that experiment and and that's his picture of simulating the experiment, the equipment that he used. And then he actually said that this was a picture that he took when he was in, uh, um, what was it? I think Australia maybe, but he said that it, the building looked like it was something about the building falling over and it and it reminded him of adding a plus c to the, <laughs> to the his integral so that's why he chose that picture uh, and then c is for cockatoo and like and then he he actually at some point where was it i don't know if the it, it might not actually play but one in his original powerpoint the uh, the this this was actually a little video of it the water flowing into the bottle there but the fact that he he decided to to take that problem and just run with it i like that to me shows the the type of like deeper learning that i would always want and so by just leaving it wide open. I, I think that I, I, I got what I wanted. He got what he wanted. Like he wanted to, he, he, and, and this is a student who, who told me at the beginning of the semester, you know, professor, like I, I'm a hardworking guy and I, 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 I'm taking this class after work and, and I really want to know how this applies to my real life and my job because uh, those application problems really matter to me. And so that was all in his weekly self-assessment that he told me in the first week. And it, it said, like, what else do you want to tell me? Well, right in week one, he told me that. And so guess what? Like I've been tailoring my class to like uh, students ha have said things like, can you do more application problems? One student said, I really like that Kahoot. And so uh, I've done more Kahoot. So whatever it is that I've seen in those weekly self-assessments, I've, I've tried to incorporate. So here is the college algebra assignment. I'll tell you that this one was a little bit more vague. It, it was just, but I'm doing, I'm showing you these as examples of what could be done as an, in an online class or an online environment. But I, I asked students to, to just simply use, use at least 10 equations to, um, at least 10 equations to draw a picture or a, or a word and using graphs, but then at least five of them had to have a restricted domain or range. Now, 
this is the first time I think ever that I think the majority of my students finally understand something about piecewise functions because that restricted domain is not something that they're, they're good at. They always want to extend the line farther, the curve farther when they're graphing than they should. And so I, I'll tell you like that, that person just drew math. Uh, that one drew his name. Uh, that one, oh, that guy, I'll tell you that you can see he only did five, uh, seven equations and did not have any restricted domain or ranges. But again, like I said, my, my goal for this is to get them to uh, competency. So I, the student got an email from me saying, uh, here's what I needed you to do to get the hundred percent. So uh, I wanted to wait till I, I found the one that I really liked because one guy really did it. I'm telling you, like he, I like cars. Oh, this one I liked. I really liked that one. Like I, that student did a, a great job on that one, but uh, let's see. But you know what? I'll, I'll tell you that I did the same thing with the students and I did sort of a gallery walk of them, like displaying their graphs so that they could see what other students in the class did. And they really, really enjoyed this. This student plays guitar. And so he made uh, like something to do with mu music and playing like, a note, a certain, a treble clef, I think something on a guitar. Uh, let's see. So I told this student that this looked like the, the, X's that come up when somebody gets something wrong on Family Feud, but you know, like that's what I I told them. And then, oh, I really like this one because the the student noticed that I I was putting images in Desmos and class, so he put a shoe in the background. So I like that, and uh, that student likes uh, skateboarding and. I, I really like that. I really don't know, like if that's a like a supposed to be hair or cap on the on the guy's head, but I think it was still uh, good. All of the different things that you can see that students dig, like the the flag right there, or just A B C D. Sorry to interrupt. Are they doing this in class or are they? Uh, so this was a. Uh, at home assignment, but then I actually showed the the everyone's pictures during class so they could see what other students were like, could do. So, so uh, would would that be able to see others <clears throat> post like without you showing everything to them, or uh, they can only see what they have? They can only see what they have because I I've. I have them submit it as a grade and not a discussion, but you could have them do it, submit it as a discussion, but, and then like just upload a picture of what they created. But I, I'll tell you that this semester though, I, I've had so many problems with students running out of space with their, their canvas uh, uploads that I just started putting the notes and all the graphs and things like that from class in a Google folder and giving them the link to that. So I put the things like that in here also so that they can see, like just give a link to a folder of everyone's completed projects, which again, I don't, none of the students uh, have gotten less than a hundred percent. So anyone's work who is that, that is there I like either it was a hundred percent or they know what they, you know, uh, or I told the student what they need to do to get the hundred percent. But, uh, it, and then the, the other thing I did for a calc one class, like another way to use the, the Google jam boards that I, I used is I, I just had the students for my calc one class, like match up the uh, the graphs with the um, the limits with the description and words because the students were having trouble with 
with limits from the left, limits from the right, removable versus non-removable discontinuities and, and things like that. So I, I'd say that that's pretty much uh, it. So is there anything you'd like to add, Enda? No, I just like to see what everything that you have here, because in my classes now, the gap between the students are really wide. So it's not good for me to put them into groups because I do not like to have the groups that have all the students that are really good and then the weak student in another group. But if I mix them, then the weaker students would just follow whatever the strong students doing. And so I don't, and they don't like that either. When I offer them to do things in group, they said, no, no, no. We prefer to have the whole class doing things together. So I leave it at that now. Yeah, I, I'd say that that's part of why I, part of why the, like in the past I've mixed up the groups, but this semester I, decided just to pre-define the groups at the beginning of the semester. And, and then on the very first day, I told the students, these are the people you'll be with the entire semester. So you have to get to know them. And if somebody misses class, you need to check in on them or, or like, or like, you know, or check in with them or, or if, um, if like somebody misses a class, like just the, the next class, just re say something like, well, remember what we talked about in a group the last class to try to get the, the person back on track and just, you know, basic things like that. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, is this working for the class, the lower level class or just the higher level class? So I'll say that it it's, it actually did work really well with uh, my uh, math 1000. And so uh, I haven't, I'm not teaching math 50 this semester, so I'm not sure uh, how it would work, but I, I know that uh, my, you know, my students have at least like the time to to um, even if they're in the big breakout rooms and they end up not talking about math at, at all, I, I've realized that sometimes I go into the breakout room and I hear them talking about their chemistry class or their physics class or, or whatever. And, and I've realized that these are the types of things, <clears throat> excuse me, that the the students would normally like do in the hallway before class or like stick stick around yeah. after class mm -hmm. to talk about and they don't have that space to do that anymore like it's sort of like with with the instructors like I miss like just walking down the, the hallway and seeing people uh, teaching or like talking about different things that come up in in classes and so I know the students miss it the same as we do as instructors and so i honestly like even if all they get out of it is a couple of minutes to talk with somebody else about other stuff then at least when that breakout room time is over that's not in their mind anymore and they can focus on the math problems again so I've realized even for the groups that don't get a lot of math done during the breakout room time, that like giving them the instructions that, hey, it's okay if you got off track and didn't do very much today in your group, we'll still make sure that you get that, that material and still you know, uh, master it. So that's why I, I do show different solutions uh, that other groups did so that they can uh, see what what each group did and uh, and it and and then it, like I said it's off of their mind and it gets them to talk to each other and that's what I think 
makes them feel like they're a community together. So, um, oh, yeah. So I, I know that since it's just the two of us into that, I'll, I'll show you whatever you want, actually. But <laughs> I, I figure if I go through some, some of the like links of examples of things, it might be uh, more helpful. But uh, what, uh, but do you have any things specific or any questions you want oh, to ask, Inda? I just like to see what you have and then ask question when I see it. Okay. Because yeah. Like like now, what I feel is my probably the students are tired of doing these online things, like they are burning out. So last semester was better than this semester for me with my students, the interaction. Now they are just tired. And some students, the good students, they suddenly stop coming to class. And then turn out that, like what you said earlier, they have to work because the, the boss changed their schedule and they have to come in early and they can only take day off when they are having tests. So yeah, well, I, I cannot help that. Right? I cannot say that, oh, you cannot do that because it's yeah. their life. And then I always also have students that do not even know how to use the online system, the canvas and everything. So one of my students didn't do the first two tests because the students didn't even know that there were tests that they were supposed to do online they are the link to Newton. They didn't even know that that those things existed. So it's really hard. And I have a lot of those kind of students this semester compared to last semester. So it's hard. And then they just giving up of coming to class. They just they submitting their works, but not doing anything in the class. And when they came to the class, it's just for the name's sake. You know what I mean? Like when I called them, asking them questions, they didn't reply because they didn't even dare. It's just they joined the meeting, but then they disappear. Yeah. So. And well, and I know that I actually know that there's one or two students who are in my classes who actually are, are not actually... Uh, there because when I send them to the breakout rooms they never go to the breakout yeah. rooms mm -hmm. but it's only one or two and it's because they know that the like I think they've realized that I they have to do something with their breakout room people or else that they, they everyone will notice and so I, I will say though that the having different ways for students to get the material like handouts or live lecture videos are all useful but uh, with handouts there are some tips for it but I'll, I'll say that I have my lecture notes posted on canvas and probably if they feel like oh I can study from here I don't have to attend the class probably that's what they feel. yeah it, but I put my notes online too but I'll tell you that these are uh, like when you write the the IBL notes, th this is one example from uh, uh, Stan. Uh, and so he he always recommends that you you make it more of a tutorial and mm -hmm. then you give the write out the solutions in advance. And then this is the one that he gave as a sample on the on the AIBL website of him writing out the the solution before class and then he posts them right after class so that that students can uh, look at it and check their work if they um if they weren't in class but i know that i i'll make sure that you have these handouts and uh, like or the yeah. powerpoint yes, but please. Mm -hmm. even but the the ones i made this one for mm -hmm. my my linear algebra class and i i will like tell them like step by step what you need to do or if it's something like uh, where is it if if there's an important theorem coming up i i i usually like have them read it out loud either in their small groups or even read it i tell them read it out loud to yourself and then we'll 
I'll, I'll call on somebody to summarize what they said or type what you had as a summary in the chat if we're doing this in a live class or if it's they're reading it after class on their own then they at least have instructions that they can't just skip over the theorem you know like because i feel like students do that sometimes and they only come back and reference it if they think that they need it so it's explicitly there you have to read this you have to summarize this you have to think mm -hmm. about why you didn't understand it but but one thing that I'll I'll say that I did this semester is uh, like a a homework assignment actually is I I took there's a whole bunch of of uh, well are there any of these ones that you want to see specifically into like a specific topic that might uh... Uh, can I see what you have in the copy of law of exponents there? oh yes. Uh, yeah, so these are all Wolfram Alpha activities that I found, but I modified them so that students could actually do them on their their own. And so it's so this first one is like this is just like a, the general idea, but if they compute this a to the second times a to the fourth they have to i even show them like here here's how to type in that notation because they even if they're not using wolfram alpha they need to know that caret symbol means exponent on their calculator even so i think it does help them and then they have to put in a a screenshot of their answer and then the same thing and then they do a, div a division problem one with the um uh the power rule there and then and then based off of those they're asked like what do you think the general rule would be and then and then they're they're asking to you to here uh, use your rule to compute the next one then check it using wolfram alpha then try to find a rule for dividing and then apply your rule and then check it if you're right. So the thing is, is that they can't get this wrong. Like if, if they make a guess at a rule for problem eight and then they apply it in problem nine and it's wrong, they're going to find out in problem 10, you know? So like I, I make them like go through these types of things and the steps and I tell them there's no right or wrong answers because I want you to just see like think about the rule before you actually check to see if you got it right you know so I I think that this has encouraged them to to um, do that type of thing and I'll tell you that <clears throat> This is the funniest thing. Like I, I usually would say that I, I wouldn't want a student to use Wolfram Alpha a lot because I, there, there are students who can easily cheat that way and this and that and just find the answers. But I've realized that asking the questions this way, I'm getting more of, I already know that answer. Why are you making me enter a screenshot? Why do I have to type it in the computer? Why do I have to go to Wolfram Alpha? And now they, they're like saying, I don't want to use the computer. So I, I think it's kind of funny, but at the same time, I'm reminding them that I still want you to enter your screenshot because I, I want you to get used to seeing that that's the, the notation A caret two asterisk a carrot four that you would see and that you might have to type in and then this is how you would see it if it were like typed in a book and so you have to like know different ways of notation and so i i want you to to um see what the computer gives you so i i, I thought that was funny that now i'm i sort of have to like tell some of them you have to use a computer <laughs> so uh, there's that and then the other things I, I would say are 
that the oh where was it yeah the the these are just ideas for the what i would say would be done in a an ibl synchronous class but there there are a lot of ibl methods that can still be used online like the stop and go like i was using with you and mike earlier like giving you a minute to think about it and then we uh, share out or breakout rooms or breakout groups or some in-class activities from the handouts and sometimes i <clears throat> have them work on it individually sometimes in a group sometimes i just work through it with them uh, sometimes there's whole class discussion and it happens where they ask questions over the microphone or type in the chat. I do call on them by name and just say like, all right, like I, I'm going to call on this person now. And, and they do know that I try to call on all of them at least once per class. And, and, and I, I, and I do acknowledge like, Hey, like there might be a time when you have to step away. So put it in the chat. So I know that, that I, I don't call on you until you come back, you know, or the three, two, one go is where you actually have the students type the answer in the chat, but they don't send the answer until you tell them to all send it at the same time. So that, yeah. <laughs> so that uh, no students are really looking ahead at the, what somebody else got. And so uh, that, that's a different technique, but uh, so here's some things that I don't know if you might want to use end of, but have you heard of that quiz? Uh, here, let me close all of these because it might make it go a little bit faster, but that if you haven't heard of that quiz, I, I really like it because the, the students actually I found will go there themselves and then they go here and then they can put how many questions they want, what level of difficulty they want, and if they want a timer, if they want feedback, and if they want integers and negatives and uh, and then they can they can even get a URL to like to go to this specific quiz and so i i realized that i send this to them as a, a link at the beginning of the semester i tell them like if you're looking for extra practice to see if you really understand a problem like go here like because you know like one technique that we always tell the students is try to write your own test question or something like that or like write a question to quiz yourself with well, you know what, they're not, I, I found that they're not very good at writing questions. And so if they can at least uh, go here and then uh, like, like write the, like have the computer, like do the, the generating for them. I, I've seen them actually like make the URLs and send it to each other's quizzes, which I thought that was sort of like funny that that they wanted to see if they could do their quiz faster than in the, somebody else in their group or things like that. And it's uh, so I think that that when I see that, I feel good that I I have a good sense that they built that community, and then. If, have you seen the Jeopardy Labs and uh, the what? Uh, Jeopardy Labs. <clears throat> no. like, like if you go here, then if you want like a a Jeopardy about fractions, then then you could like there's lots of them, and then uh, you can do it interactively. But if you don't know what it, it, it like, if you want to see what the questions are in advance, you can do print, and then it will show you all of the questions that, that would be on that Jeopardy game with the answers. And so I usually uh, print this out in advance so that I know the difficulty of the questions. And then I split the, the, uh, the, the class up into their groups. And then if they do this one, 
and if they get right, you know, I just put plus or if they get wrong, minus. And then uh, the reason why I usually print that handout first is because once you like reveal the answer, it's there. So you can't really like give a, the other team a chance to get right if you reveal the answer, you know. Um, so I, I like that it it grays it out after that. But uh, the students like the, the Jeopardy. And then if if the team gets it wrong, then I I just I usually just like use the zoom tool and like work out the problem on the screen so that they can see how it was done. But uh, so at least this, I've, I've realized that even if I were to go through the whole, like even if they got none of them right and I had to go through the Jeopardy game, every single one of them, it, it, mixes it up from just being the regular lecture you know yeah like like so then they're they're saying well this isn't what i was expecting today i was expecting him to go through the handout again today well no we're doing something different today <laughs> uh the the math vote questions i really do use these all the time with my classes and i i think that they're good i my differential equation class, I think really likes that. The, the Kahoot is, I think, um, oh, and if you ever want like some Kahoots, I, I can, I'm willing to share what I have, but I don't have a lot, but I do know I have like one of my, my friends actually created Kahoots for every topic in his algebra class that you could copy over at some point if you want them but I actually want to revise them because they now allow you to type in math equations and they didn't used to so so it's better than it used to be and then uh have you heard of quizzes and yeah uh, but I never use it so I just heard somebody give presentation on that but yeah so quizzes is another one that that is good. I'm using Pear Deck right now to present with, and it I like it because it it does let me do a little bit of adding those interactive slides, and then uh, and then one thing that I I will say, Inda, that if you haven't seen it, have you ever seen the marble slides? Not this marble slide, yeah. Oh, but you've seen some of them. Yeah, but okay. I don't think this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like the actually the lines ones I think were was the original one. So I I think that like when I, I actually have have given like marble slides as a homework assignment this semester, it, and I'm thinking about doing it in class one day and just saying like, all right, by the end of the class, like work with your groups and by the end of the class, like have all 24 done, you know, and, and that's your assignment for the day, like just to mix it up a little bit, because I, I feel like they're going to learn more about like say slope or like shifting or transformations than if I just show, show them, you know? So, um, but that, that's pretty much all that I, I have. <laughs>